I'm entitling uh, my, my comments about peace writ large, peace studies writ large. And that term is borrowed liberally from Mary Anderson, who had this study on peace education writ large. Um, the reason I got into this topic, <clears throat> there are really two reasons. Number one is um, I've been involved with a global peace education project that uh, Zedin Yousafzai, the father of Malala Yousafzai, has helped to form and start in Canada. And as part of that, where we're trying to promote peace education, it's been really obvious that we have multiple different definitions of what we want to do with peace studies. And so it's been very confusing for our organization to talk about peace studies because uh, of the board, we all have if we're 10 board members, we have 12 different visions for what peace studies is all about. The second uh, reason why this is of interest to me is uh, I've been approved for a sabbatical project that's going to look at the six different faculties at our university and how each faculty has a role or an obligation to promote peace, so engineering, health sciences, science and math, and so forth. So I'm intrigued by that whole notion of um, what does peace curriculum mean for the University of Waterloo as well as for this global education purposes. So there's two competing mixed and at times uh, different uh, re reasons for this project. Uh, I took a look at, um, there, are, there are lots and lots and lots of different curricula that talk about peace studies. And so um, I, part of my research, I've looked at 60 different curric peace curricula and tried to identify what's there and what's missing and what could be the opportunity for the, the cutting edge of peace studies. And so I'm just gonna very quickly review <coughs> what I think are six main themes in the Peace Studies uh, program or Peace Studies arena. The first is uh, what I would call conflict resolution framework for uh, peace studies. And this is where uh, the, the curriculum talks about conflict resolution, tolerance, uh, cultural sensitivity, and so forth. And the idea behind it is that if we simply have more people understanding and relating to each other peaceably, the theory is that peace will uh, thrive. The downside of that is this um, the study that Mary Anderson did a few years ago that basically said that simply because you have more people or more key people like leaders in communities who are sensitive to peace issues that doesn't necessarily mean that there will be success because for example even if there are lots of Israeli and Palestinian kids who like each other now and understand each other come the next Gaza or the next suicide bombing and oftentimes the uh, the peace that is based on simple relationships and alone in conflict resolution will diminish and deteriorate rapidly. The second way that people have oftentimes in curriculum oftentimes have looked at uh, peace studies is well promote democracy and in democracy good things happen. Well oftentimes democracy does lead to good things and I'm a, a huge fan of democratic traditions. Oftentimes democratic traditions can also be violative of human rights. Uh, if you look at the residential schools in Canada and other uh, situations where women have been discriminated against, minorities have been discriminated against, oftentimes democracies have affirmed that and supported that. And with democracy, sometimes you get the will of the majority imposing uh, their will on people in a way that's not healthy. A third way of looking at peace education is through the rule of law. And that if only there are consistent rules that are consistently and fairly applied, then peace can prevail. The challenge with this is that oftentimes uh, virtually every major systematic human rights violation in the world has been approved by law. Apartheid in South Africa was lawful according to the uh, South Africans. Uh, racial discrimination in the US was lawful. Um, the American part of the uh, treatment of Aboriginals was lawful under the laws that they had. So simply because you're following law doesn't mean that peace will prevail. And here's a challenge with this whole idea of, of law and peace. Law can be a shield that protects people, but oftentimes it's a sword that harms people as well. A fourth way of looking at peace education and peace studies is, well, if we promote human rights. The whole point of the international human rights movement was to be a vaccine against war. The drafters of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights basically said, if human rights are respected, there's no need for war. People won't pick up a gun, cause violence. And secondly, um, nations that respect human rights um, can also, will also respect the rights of their neighboring countries. The problem with this approach <coughs> is that while it's true that human rights does offer a very helpful and interesting framework, human rights is like the 
the structure of this room where it has walls and a ceiling and a floor and doors and windows and so forth, that law in this way tends to be very rigid and very immovable. Um, in winter, if you're here in winter, when it's minus 15 or 20 degrees centigrade, we would be very cold without the structure of the walls in the windows and the doors. Um, if there is no structure, we are more subject to arbitrary, deten or arbitrary harm that's caused to us. The problem with the structure of, of looking at law and human rights as a way of building peace is that it can lead to a very cold and impersonal peace within the room. We might hate each other's guts in this room, but as long as we're protected from the elements, which is what human rights would, would require, it appears that there's peace. <clears throat> and so there's something missing simply with this human rights law-based approach, even though it says no discrimination, because it does not require love, reconciliation, forgiveness, all this kind of human stuff that makes life with dignity worth having. Another way of looking at peace education is through civil society. When individuals work together, how do they create peace, and how do they create the kind of world that we want? Um, and I love the quote from Ellen Atkinson, who wrote about why civil society is so important for building a peaceful uh, society. He said, civil society is humanity's conscience, its early warning system, its laboratory. It's where the world's thoughtful, committed citizens go about making change. If you look at the human rights movement, it started with civil society. The environmental movement started with civil society. The corporate responsibility movement started with civil society. The fair trade movement started with civil society. And you look at almost all the positive social change, much of it started with civil society and government subsequently picked it up. The challenge is, what do you do if you have weak political systems? The last approach that I found within um, um, peace curricula is what I would call a world transformation approach. And again, these are very general categories. Uh, and what happens here is that peace education is looking at trying to transform the view that people have towards the world. So, we look at the world differently and so forth. And <clears throat> the image here is uh, of a boat in a small, a small boat in a large ocean. I think the challenge with this approach, although I agree that it's important to transform our world views, is that when we think we are in an ocean that is so big and our boat is so small, it's easy to become discouraged and give up. <clears throat> and yesterday, for example, one of the panelists talked about someone he, who, a student who had been in her class who basically had decided after being challenged that her worldview was wrong that she needed to take a year off for therapy and reflection about how to move forward, was paralyzed uh, by this kind of view. So what I've looked at in terms of these six different um, approaches is a, a way that I think a lot of different peace curriculum offer and uh, the way they operate and I'm not disagreeing with them so I'm not saying they're wrong, I'm just saying they all have an important role and function. What I'm looking at in terms of how do we move ahead with peace education, peace studies in a way that's impactful tomorrow. And I rely a lot on what I think is a, a very interesting um, theor theoretical approach by Bill Urey, who basically talks about our goal is to avoid violence. And on the slide on the screen there, the dotted line at the top is we're trying to avoid violence. And he says, we have three chances to do that. We can prevent conditions with which, if unprevented, will escalate into violence. If we can't prevent, we resolve them. If we can't resolve them, we at least contain them. And then he breaks it down into the ten roles of the third party, or the third siders, as he puts it. And I think this is a framework that I'd like to flesh out more as it relates to peace education, because when you look at the ten roles that do the prevent role, the resolve role and the contain role. All of these are very interesting, very pragmatic, and we can all do that in our daily life through our vocational work um, in the NGOs that we associate with and as we promote uh, other policies. And I won't go through this in detail, but the basic principle is that I think as we look at how to make peace studies and peace curriculum more impactful, here is one interesting way of being able to say, let's look at how all disciplines that we teach relate to the ten roles. All vocations we go into relate to the ten roles. All faculties that we're associated with relate to the ten roles. All NGOs that we look at relate to the ten roles. Now, I'm not sure that these are exactly the same ten roles that I would like to have. I think about seven or eight of them really fit well, and 
I wrestle with a few of them, but this gives a framework then for looking at what is the impact of everything we do? How does, it, how does this kind of work add up to more? So just to give you a couple examples of what does this really mean. I'll just take two, two occupations here. <clears throat> um, if we define peace to be people have a better life, more opportunity, more chance, more hope, more education, and those kinds of things, I could make a compelling argument that the toilet engineers are the world's biggest peacemakers. The toilet expanded life expectancy by 20 years. 80%, um, some estimate 80% of the world's illnesses that inhibit the self-actualization of us are caused by bad sanitation. Um, every 20 seconds or every three seconds, depending on which statistics you believe, a kid dies because of, of a, a sanitation-related issue. And so if we look at the way that engineers, and especially toilet engineers and sanitation engineers, uh, are impacting peace, the toilet engineers are huge peacemakers. Accountants, just to use another silly example. Um, I would argue that the conflicts in um, Nigeria, Congo, probably Sudan, even the Ukraine, could oftentimes, or there could be a huge uh, link traced back to corruption and dishonesty. Um, how do accountants build peace? Can you have world peace without accountants doing their job well? How impactful is good accounting? Why do accountants agree to be corrupt? The, the bottom line here <clears throat> is that I think when we look at, at the way, a, a different way of looking at the structure of peace in terms of the long-term impact, if we can find a way, again using Mary Anderson's diagram here of if we simply are educating more students or smart students without impacting the underlying professions that have these standards that are promoting peace. So if we, as peace studies people, go through a conscious effort to determine, work with the accountants and the engineers and the nanotech people about how their discipline builds and sustains peace and structure that into the social political level, which is what Mary Anderson says is most effective, the bottom side of the two, uh, the, the four uh, quadrants up there. That's when it's effective, it sticks. And so I think the challenge, as I see it, is to how do we create a new paradigm that creates this pressure from the bottom up? I think it's a, very different than the, the most common six different curriculum I described earlier, conflict resolution and the rule of law and democracy and so forth, that really infuses and uh, it affects every discipline and uh, occupation. And I think at that point, um, we live it out in a very pragmatic way that I think addresses the concern I heard uh, at the awards luncheon about uh, what do we do tomorrow? Because we can see and study and affirm how, at least at the university level, every discipline, every faculty, every uh, department has an obligation to build peace in some way. And I think the, the Bill Urey model gives one interesting way of looking at that. Uh, I'll just close here by <coughs> just reflecting a little bit that in our peace studies program at the University of Waterloo, we're starting to take some baby steps to do this. And uh, I was just uh, thinking before as, as preparing for this, this uh, afternoon that we've developed a course on peace and fair trade, peace and business, peace and tourism, peace and engineering, peace and disability, peace and civil society, peace and policing, and peace and the environment. And what we're trying to do with that is to make it very, very practical and infuse these core values into uh, every discipline. So I'll stop there.